On May 5th of 1792, George Washington asked James Madison to come see him at the president's house on Market Street in Philadelphia. Washington had no intention of serving a second term as president, and he needed Madison's advice as to how and when to announce his intention of retiring. He was thinking about announcing his retirement when Congress convened in October, but he was afraid that might be too close to the election, because the election of electors was going to happen in November and early December, and then the electors were going to elect their president in December. But a more delicate issue was how. How was he going to announce that he was retiring? And the reason this was delicate was that the generation of the founding fathers felt that running for office was uncouth. And acting like you wanted the office was inappropriate. They thought that the electors would simply come together and vote for who they thought was the best man for the job. And nobody would run for office. Nobody would put their name forward and say, I want to be president. If he was going to come out and say, I don't want to serve a second term, he was afraid that would look presumptuous, like he was assuming everyone was going to vote for him. Madison protested. He did not want Washington to leave office. And so Washington explained to him, gave him reasons that he had already given to the heads of his executive departments, which was that he was tired. He was physically tired. He was aging. He was 60 at this point, but he felt older than that. He had not wanted to be president to begin with. He only did it because everyone told him that there was no way the federal government was going to survive unless he was the first president. And uh, he did believe in the new federal government. And, uh, and so he did it for the sake of the country, not for himself. And then once this term was over, he was sure, well, that's it. I can be done now. I can go home. Because all Washington ever wanted to do was just be at Mount Vernon, his estate in Northern Virginia, and oversee things. He loved farm management. That was his favorite thing to do, was just, you know, deciding what crops to grow and when to grow them and the various little crises that come up when you're a farmer and how to deal with them and managing resources, managing the buildings and, you know, doing the books and all that. He loved all that stuff. He didn't like being president at all, but he liked running a farm. And to, just to be clear, he wasn't just a regular old farmer. He was a plantation owner. He had servants and slaves working under him that did all the work. He was just a manager. And he would go back to Mount Vernon whenever he could while he was president. Uh, whenever Congress was not in session, basically, he would run back to Mount Vernon. But there was another reason that he did not want to be president, and that was that he hated all the arguing. Uh, during his first term in office, uh, some very far-reaching proposals were put forward by his administration that were highly controversial and split the elites of the Republic into two camps that fought vociferously against each other. And it got really nasty. And Washington hated that. Washington had this attitude that we should all be able to get along. We should all be on the same page. Uh, I mean, the mere fact that he was bringing Madison in to ask for advice about how he should negotiate departing office shows that he was doing that because Madison was actually on the camp, in the camp opposed to the administration. Um, and Washington really wanted to bring everybody together and maintain the team atmosphere that they had had uh, before, or they had felt that they had had before. So what were these controversies? They mostly had to do with a series of reports that Secretary of the Treasury Alexander Hamilton had submitted to Congress over a long period, first at the beginning of 1790, and then a second report at the end of 1790, and then another one at the end of 1791. But right away with that first report in January of 1790, he caused a whole storm of controversy to erupt. Back during the Revolutionary War, the Continental Congress had no money because it had no power to tax. And so it had to turn to the states and ask the states for money, but the states wouldn't give it money. So it just had no money. And so then the, which was one of the reasons why they ended up creating the constitution and have a stronger federal government. So the government could have an ability to generate its own revenue. Uh, but the, the Continental Congress, lacking money, but needing money in order to prosecute the war against Britain, had issued basically tons of IOUs, saying, you know, uh, instead of giving you $10, I'll give you this IOU for 
And so all these IOUs were flowing, were kind of circulating in the country. They had originally gone to soldiers, uh, veterans of the Revolutionary War, and business owners and stuff who had uh, like given supplies to the American army, to the Continental Army. And then after the war, there was a general feeling that the government was never going to be able to pay back these IOUs. And so these veterans and these business owners who had been paid in IOUs, they might have like $10 or $100 worth of continental paper, but they're never going to see that money. So then somebody would come along and be like, well, you know what? I'll give you a buck 50 for that $10 note. And they're like, well, I can either hold on to the $10 note and never get the $10, or I can sell it and get a buck 50 now. So that's what a lot of people did. They would sell their continental certificates or IOUs for way below the face value to speculators. So these speculators were purchasing these certificates, uh, gambling essentially, taking a risk that they might not get their money back because it, they might not, you know, they might not ever be able to redeem those notes for face value, but they were hoping that they might be able to in the future. And so what happened was all these continental notes that had been distributed among veterans and business owners moved into the pockets of speculators. So Hamilton, one of his proposals in 1790 was to redeem all of those certificates at face value. Now the opposition to this, which was very strong, there were a lot of people who had a visceral negative reaction to this idea because they thought it was unfair. From their point of view, what was happening was Hamilton was going to create a scenario where poor people were going to be disadvantaged for the sake of the rich. Another proposal that Hamilton put forward was assumption of state debts. Because during the Revolutionary War, the Continental Congress had incurred debt in the, in the form of the IOUs that it had paid people with, but also uh, the states had incurred debt too. Uh, now, some of the states had paid off the debt. Some of the states still had their old war debt. And Hamilton proposed that the federal government assume all the state debts. And for Hamilton, that would have a couple of advantages. First of all, it would mean that uh, the debt would be easier to service and pay off. The other reason was that he saw this as a way of strengthening the federal government of promoting more unity among the state. And we have the way we word it, the language we use oftentimes implicates us into one camp or the other. Because for Hamilton and people in his camp, centralization was a good thing because it meant that the whole country would be stronger. They had already seen during the 1780s under the Articles of Confederation, the problems that could arise with states not being in coordination with each other and basically acting as independent countries. And they wanted to avoid those problems by maintaining a strong central government. The reaction to that, coming from Jefferson and Madison, was that no centralization is bad. We need to maintain the sovereignty of the states. So we need a weak central government and a strong state government. And that will be a better guarantor of individual liberty. And actually that point about Madison is interesting because this reflects a transformation that Madison had undergone during Washington's first term. Back in the 1780s, Madison had been one of the big proponents of central government, of, of, of a, a stronger federal government. And that was the role he had played at the Constitutional Convention. That was, you know, that was the case he had made when he was writing the Federalist Papers. The Federalist Papers were a series of essays that were written during the time of uh, the debates over ratification of the Constitution. Because the Constitution was written in 1787 and then it went to the states for ratification. And in each individual state, they had debates about whether they should ratify the Constitution, go along with it, or whether they should reject it. And the Federalist Papers were written by Hamilton and Madison, along with John Jay, um, supporting the idea of a federal government, a strong federal government. Um, and so that was the Madison of the, night of the 1780s, but then by the early 1790s, Madison had migrated from that position to a position of uh, suspicion of a strong federal government uh, in favor of strong states, uh, state governments instead. And then in late 1790, Hamilton put forward his proposal for a national bank 
a bank of the United States. And uh, his reason for putting this forward was, again, it would be an institution that would allow for the growth of the American economy because it would make it easier for banks to get capital, it could provide credit for other banks, to make other banks stronger. It would be the place where the U.S. government could deposit its money. And in contrast to every other bank in the country at the time, which was chartered by states and could only operate within individual states, this would be a bank chartered by the federal government and therefore able to operate in all the states. And Jefferson and Madison objected to the national bank idea on the grounds that it was not constitutional, that the Constitution did not explicitly give Congress the power to establish a bank and to, to charter a bank, and therefore it doesn't have the power to do that. And this was actually a really common argument that would go between the two sides. Jefferson's view was that the federal government only has powers that are explicitly stated in the Constitution as having. Whereas Hamilton's view was that since the Constitution says that the Congress will make laws that will promote the general welfare of the country, anything that promotes the general welfare of the country is constitutional for the Congress to do. Since the National Bank would promote the general welfare of the country, the National Bank would be constitutional. Now, these arguments over policy took on a cultural tone because they combined with a pre-existing difference of attitude toward what the revolution had actually meant. Basically, there, were, there was a difference in attitude in how far does the revolution go. Uh, for some, the revolution was simply a matter of, we're going to get rid of British oversight, but otherwise we're going to remain British in culture, in civilization, you might say. We're still going to be, we're still going to be British at heart. Um, and they tended to look at Britain as the model for what to follow. Um, ha Alexander Hamilton was in that camp, along with John Adams. John Adams was kind of the embodiment, in many ways, of this attitude, because he had this kind of aristocratic attitude. As vice president, John Adams' role was to preside over the Senate. And back then, the vice president would actually do that, uh, unlike today, where the vice president hardly ever shows up in the Senate, even though he is he or she is presider over the Senate. In John Adams' day, Vice President Adams actually did go to the Senate sessions and presided over the Senate. One of the first bills that went before Congress was, what titles should we use for the president? And John Adams wanted to use this really fancy title, um, like His Excellency, the President of the United States and Protector of the Rights of the Same, or something like that. And then when John Adams would come into the Senate to preside, he would wear this really fancy coat and he would put on the ceremonial sword and walk into the Senate with a ceremonial sword. And a lot of the senators and representatives were like, what's this? What's he doing? And Jefferson especially had so much contempt for Adams and, and like the way Adams was acting. He's like, this is not what the revolution was about. Uh, this is not what Amer the American spirit is about. He didn't really use that language, but it was basically his attitude. Like, we Americans are about equality and egalitarianism, and so we shouldn't have this idea of class distinction. Jefferson's view, Jefferson had a very particular and very idealized view of what the American Republic should be. He envisioned a republic of yeoman farmers, meaning people who owned their own land who were able to produce on that land all of their basic needs. So nobody would own tons and tons of acreage and nobody would be landless. Everybody would have their plot of land that they would live on. And so he was imagining an agricultural republic. That's what he, he thought the economy should be agricultural. And so when he was hearing Hamilton talk about how important it is to grow the American industry and you know, expand the banking sector and all this stuff, that like Jefferson hated that. He was, he just, he hated it. So in the early 1790s, two new factions were emerging. And these were different factions from the factions that had existed during the debate over the Constitution. The Constitution was ratified in 1788, and then the federal government under the new Constitution went into effect in 1789. But during the time of the debate over ratification, during 1787-88, there were two schools of thought. On the one hand, you had the people who thought that a new strong central government would be a good idea and therefore the constitution should be ratified. And there were people who were opposed to the new constitution. And they were called federalists and anti-federalists because you were either in favor of a federal constitution, a stronger federal government, or you were opposed to it. Back in the 1789 election, that was the big issue. 
Are we in favor of the federal government or are we opposed to it? But that had changed going from 1789 to 1792. That old conflict between Federalists and Anti-Federalists disappeared. Everyone just kind of came to terms with the fact that the federal government now exists. And the question now is, to what extent can we mitigate the negative effects as, as seen you know, from the perspective of Anti-Federalists? To what extent can we mitigate the negative effects of this new strong federal government? How, how weak can we make this new supposedly strong federal government? That was the new approach that many of the Anti-Federalists took. Now, the Federalists, the people who had been in favor of the Constitution, they went through a split during the course of Washington's first term as a reaction mainly to Hamilton's policies, but also to these other issues like Adams, you know, talking about how great the British system is and stuff. So there was a, a split where some were in favor of strong, a stronger central government and others were in favor of a weaker central government. And that's the break that you see where Jefferson was on one side and Hamilton was on the other. Both Hamilton and Jefferson, along with Madison, Adams, they had all supported the Constitution. But now they were dividing over what role is the Constitution going to play? What role is the federal government going to play in this new country? And on the one hand, you had Jefferson, who advocated for a weak central government and a strict interpretation of the Constitution and for, you know, an agricultural economy and, and for egalitarianism. And on the other hand, you had Hamilton, who advocated for a strong central government, for a strong presidency, a strong executive within that government, for a, you know, a strong integration of the states economically. He was okay with class distinctions, uh, and he was in favor of growing American industry. Uh, and so these two groups, you had the Jeffersonians and the Hamiltonians, they are what emerge during the 1790-1791. And at first, they had no consistent name because no one had anticipated that these two groups would form. Um, no one really had the idea that this was going to be a permanent feature of American politics. Everyone felt like these were arguments over a particular set of circumstances that are happening right now, the arguments over Hamiltonian policy. And so everybody's idea was, this is going to play out over a course of months or maybe a couple of years, no more than that. And then things will settle down and we'll all go back to agreeing with each other. And, and actually, when Washington was going and talking with people, he, he talked to Madison about his desire to retire. He also talked to Jefferson. He talked to all the, his um, department heads. He talked to Knox. He talked to Hamilton. They all told him, please don't retire. We need you to stick around. And actually, in a conversation with Jefferson, Jefferson told him, look, you don't even have to stay in, in office for the full second term. You don't have to do a full eight years. This whole, this whole rigmarole, this whole sh all the shenanigans that are happening right now, the arguments between the good guys and the bad guys, which is how Jefferson framed it. Jefferson told him, look, this whole thing is going to blow over really soon. Uh, this, uh, these arguments that we're having, they're going to go away. You know, just a few months from now, maybe a year from now. Look, this the, the congressional elections are coming up, and he said, as, if, if we get a majority in Congress that are in favor of, basically, if we get smart, level-headed, reasonable people as opposed to Hamiltonians, then maybe we can finally uh, get some. You know, like things will settle down and be things will be normal, and then we won't have these arguments anymore. And then the Republic will be on a sure footing and then you can resign. So Jefferson told him, look, go ahead and go up for re-election. We just need you to get through 1793. Then you can resign after a year. Now, these two factions had different names for each other uh, and for themselves. So on the part of the Hamiltonians, basically they saw themselves as carrying on from the Constitutional Convention and the ratification process, they, they saw themselves as the true car like continuers of that point of view. The idea that had come up in the 1780s that the, the old system under the Articles of Confederation was not sufficient and they needed a stronger central government. That was the point of view of Hamilton and Adams. So they called themselves Federalists. And then they looked at their opponents, the Jeffersonians, and they saw them as a rabble. 
And so for Federalists, the way they framed the debate, it was a debate of order versus chaos. A strong central government that would guarantee peace and security and prosperity for the country versus anarchy, disorder, upheaval, because you'd have different special interests fighting for things, you'd have different states fighting, and so you wouldn't have unity of the country. And they would use the term democracy for them in a bad way. Because still in the 18th century, the word democracy had negative connotations. It had the connotation of basically mob rule. You have, you know, people who are easily swayed by emotional arguments, um, you know, sending the country in a direction that would be harmful for the country, harmful for themselves, but they don't know enough about policy to know that the people they're voting for are going to harm them. Uh, that was the attitude that Hamilton and Adams had. Now, Jefferson framed the difference differently. For Jefferson, it was a conflict between liberty and tyranny, between a democratic republic and a monarchy. In other words, the terms of the American Revolution back in the 1770s, when the Americans rejected the monarchy of the British and created republics and then one unified republic for themselves. And for Jefferson, he believed that his opponents, Hamilton and Adams, and their fellow Federalists, what they called Federalists, he believed that they were trying to bring the country back to monarchy, to undo the achievement of the American Revolution. And so because of that, he called himself and his own faction Republicans, or sometimes Democrats, sometimes Democratic Republicans, but the term they usually used was Republicans. Now, just to clarify, because this could potentially be a point of confusion, the Republicans of Jefferson's day are not the same as the Republicans of today. You know, in the modern United States, there is a Republican Party. That's not the same institution that uh, Jefferson was helping to create in the 1790s. The original Republicans of the 1790s continued on into the 1820s, and they split into two different parties in the 1820s, the Democrats and the Whigs. And then the Democrats continued on to the present. And so the modern Democratic Party has its roots in the Democratic Party of Andrew Jackson of the 1820s, and then going back further, uh, the Republican Party of Jefferson in the 1790s, 1800s. The modern Republican Party was founded in 1854, and they chose the name Republican because it had a certain cachet. It harkened back to Jeffersonian politics of the 1790s. Uh, and it wasn't because they necessarily saw themselves as a continuation of Jefferson's philosophy or political views. They really just chose the name because it had a uh, status, because, you know, it had been the name of a political party early in American history. That's why they picked it. It just, it had that history. It had associations of longevity or whatever. Uh, that was the only reason. That and because it's a convenient word to use because it can easily be used as both a noun and an adjective. But anyway, just to avoid confusion. And again, to reiterate, uh, these were not seen as permanent political parties. Uh, people at the time were not thinking of political parties as something that would be a permanent part of the American political system. They saw these as temporary factions arguing over particular policies and uh, and each faction they saw as a threat to the Republic, as a threat to the well-being of the people of the country. And therefore, that side would have to be like ended, would have to be suppressed, and then the country could go on and prosper. So from the standpoint of the Federalists, they saw the Republicans as dangerous demagogues who did not understand the necessities of a modern country and would end up bringing about a division and, uh, you know, a, like a separation, a dissolution of the union, ultimately is what would happen as far as they were concerned. So from the standpoint of the Federalists, they believed it was necessary for Republican ideology to disappear, to go away. So rather than having Republicans as a permanent opposition party to them, they felt that the Republicans just needed to stop being Republican. The Republicanism needed to go away. And then conversely, from the standpoint of Thomas Jefferson, it was the same. Thomas Jefferson saw the Federalists, and he did not call them Federalists. I, maybe sometimes he did, but he usually called them monocrats or monarchists. Um, but he saw them as a threat to the revolution, a threat to the ideals of the country. That They were, you know, were going to bring about tyranny, basically, is what he thought. And therefore, it's not okay 
for the well-being of the country, for these monarchists to continue among us, monarchism has to be stamped out as far as Jefferson was concerned. So uh, we have to like not think in terms of 20th century American politics. I guess 21st century American politics, perhaps a different animal. But in the 20th century, it was kind of understood that Democrats and Republicans are whatever differences they have. They're both Americans, you know, and Democrats and Republicans are going to work together for the good of the country. They have differences of opinion. And so they oppose each other in elections. But there was a sense of there's a consensus in the, you know, there was a, you know, 20th century political consensus that did not exist in the 1790s. There was no idea in the 1790s that Republicans and Federalists would get along together and, you know, represent just different aspects of the one population or, you know, that they would work together for the consensus of the Republic. That wasn't a thinking at the time. Jefferson's hatred of the Federalists was quite extreme. Um, he had this kind of fever dream that the Federalists were engaged in this grand conspiracy to reinstate monarchy in the country. I'm not exaggerating. He literally believed there was a conspiracy. Um, and what he did was he took these, he took ingredients that were true. He took factual like things and then put them together in a way that was not actual. Let me, let me explain what I mean. Both John Adams and um, Hamilton had expressed on various occasions their admiration of the British political system, of how well designed it is. And in fact, when Adams was talking about the Constitution in the US, he had thought of it, he had talked about it in terms of how it did something similar to what the British system does, where in the British system, you have the monarch and the House of Lords, which represents the aristocracy, and then the House of Commons, which represents the people, uh, sort of, you know, this is before all the reforms of the 19th century, but you know, kind of. And then, um, and then in the federal system, in the U S system, there was the presidency, which, you know, has kind of trappings of monarchy, the Senate, which is kind of like the house of Lords trappings of aristocracy, and then the Re house of representatives, which would correspond to the house of commons. So that, that was how Adams had thought of the constitution. Um, so anyway, both Hamilton and Adams had expressed admiration for the British system. So that was a true thing, which Jefferson was shocked and horrified by. Also, uh, Hamilton's financial policies were going to benefit wealthy people. That was true. Uh, no doubt about it. You know, I mean, Hamilton kind of questioned whether that was really true. But I mean, it was kind of probably true that wealthy people were going to benefit from, you know, wealthy speculators were going to benefit from funding the certificates at par, you know, stuff like that. And then in, in addition to that, there was the fact that many members of Congress were engaged in speculation or it had, you know, were owners of old continental certificates and were liable to benefit from the funding scheme. And then there was the fact that Hamilton's policies would end up promoting a, a greater federal power, you know, a greater centralization of power over what they had had before. All those things were more or less true. But in Jefferson's conspiratorial thinking mind, um, he turned that into a conspiracy where he imagined that the Federalists aimed to create a monarchy in the US. They couldn't do it openly through the through the constitutional conventions and you know through the normal process of establishing a constitution. And so they tried to do it, they were trying. Currently, in 1791-92, they were trying to create a monarchy through the back door by um, implementing policies that would benefit wealthy people, members of Congress. So you'd have these members of Congress who were going to become enriched through Hamilton's policies, and therefore they would vote for Hamilton's policies, which were designed to create more centralization in the federal system. And so he was basically co-opting the members of Congress through greed, through their greed for money making it so they could get, get, get rich through Hamilton's policies and therefore would vote in those changes to the system that would establish a monarchy in the country. That was Jefferson's idea of what was happening. And so Jefferson believed, he honestly believed that Hamilton and Adams were plotting to reinstate monarchy in the country. It wasn't just rhetoric for him. He really believed that. Um... <laughs> 
Uh, anyway, <laughs> through all of this, George Washington was trying to stay kind of above the fray, above the controversy, and wanted to maintain the friendships that he'd had both with Hamilton and with Jefferson and Madison. And this is, I think, the origin of the idea that he was somehow an independent, because he was, I mean, technically he was not engaging in the partisan, you know, bickering and stuff between the Federalists and the Republicans. So in a sense, yeah, he was an independent and nonpartisan. But on the other hand, he was a Hamiltonian, like he agreed with Hamilton's policies. And this was a source of a lot of tension between him and Jefferson and Madison which he was trying to like not like he Washington did not want that tension to happen. He didn't want any of this fighting to happen. He was he was really dismayed that all this arguing and name calling and stuff was going on because it because it went beyond just policy disagreement. I mean they they were attacking each other's character. They were calling each other traitors essentially. And these weren't just people out in the public. These were members of his own what we would call cabinet. His own Secretary of State and his own Secretary of the Treasury were mortal enemies. And it went even beyond that because um, Thomas Jefferson did this thing. Here's, here's what Thomas Jefferson did. So when the federal government started in 1789, somebody started a newspaper called the Gazette of the United States, which was an explicitly federalist organ like a Federalist paper, like it would, it would talk about what was going on in the federal government, it would report on political issues, but it always took it from the standpoint of a Federalist, somebody who was pro-Constitution, someone who was in favor of a strong federal government. Well, Thomas Jefferson was annoyed at this paper, and so he wanted to create a newspaper that would give the Republican side of things. And so he hired a guy named Freneau, to uh, work in his office, in the Secretary of State's office. And, and here's kind of the fishy thing. He hired Freneau as a, as a French translator, right? Because one of the duties of the Secretary of State was to deal with foreign affairs. He had to deal with correspondence with Europe. A lot of the correspondence was in French. And so he hired Freneau as a French translator in the Secretary of State's office. Okay, that sounds okay, except Thomas Jefferson was fluent in French. He didn't need a translator. And then when Freneau got on the government payroll, instead of having, I mean, he would have him do like some, you know, few things around the office to maintain appearances. But Freneau's main job was to be the editor of a new newspaper called the National Gazette that would promote Republican ideas. This looked really bad um, because... I mean, for obvious reasons, he got somebody on the government payroll, basically, he, you know, he's got this guy who's running this newspaper, that's a partisan newspaper, and not only is it a partisan newspaper, but it's anti-administration. Like, he's the Secretary of State in the Washington administration, and he's spearheading this movement to tear down the administration's policies, and he's doing it through the means of this newspaper, the National Gazette, the editor of which is on the government payroll. You know, like this, like, and he got him on the payroll, like, oh gosh. I mean, like, so anyway, this newspaper got started in October of 1791. And in every issue, it would just attack Hamilton, attack Hamilton's policies. It would, pu you know, publish essays talking about, you know, the, the virtues of small government and uh, the how evil a national bank would be and all this stuff. And Washington was really offended by this because he he, seen, he saw it as disloyal. Like Jefferson's supposed to be in his own administration and he's actively working to undermine the administration. He's attacking the policies of the administration. It was always framed, at least at this stage, it was always framed as it was Hamilton's policies. It was Hamilton's evil deeds. But when Washington read that, he read it as a criticism of himself. And there's really, when I was talking about he didn't like all the bickering and stuff, it's true. He didn't like the disunity in the Republic. He wanted everybody to get along, but he also really did not appreciate being attacked in the press. And it wasn't even that overt, at least at this stage. It got a little bit overt in the second term. But at this stage, um, it was all just attacks against Hamilton, but he saw that as attacks against himself. He was really offended by that. 
he he was kind of thin skinned about it and um and so that that was a lot of his feeling of like he just wanted out he didn't want to deal with this stuff anymore i mean he also just really wanted to beat him out at mount vernon and not be president but also he really hated being what he perceived as being dragged through the through the mud in the press it wasn't i mean by modern standards it was very tame but but anyway uh that that episode with Freneau kind of really harmed Washington's relationship with Jefferson. And uh, it continued to deteriorate after that. By the time Washington died in 1799, he really did not like Jefferson at all. Um, but anyway, at this stage, 1792, Washington was still trying to maintain, like, keep everybody on side, keep a good relationship with everybody. And so when he was talking about retiring, he went and got the advice not only from Hamilton, uh, but also from Jefferson and Madison. Washington deliberated over his decision for a long time, all through the summer and into the fall. On October 1st of 1792, Thomas Jefferson reported a conversation he had. Uh, it was in a letter he wrote to James Madison, where he, he had had a conversation with Washington in which Washington still expressed indecision as to whether he would really serve a second term. But sometime after that, uh, between that and, you know, beginning of October and middle of December, Washington had changed his mind and decided he'd be open to serving a second term. We don't know exactly when he made that decision or exactly what was the factor that made him change his mind, but he did, and he was open to being elected again. It was a foregone conclusion that the electors were going to vote for Washington, but it was not a foregone conclusion that they would vote for Adams. The Republicans were not happy with John Adams and wanted someone else to be vice president instead. And when they were looking around for different options, there were different names that were thrown around. Uh, but early on, a consensus began to build around Governor George Clinton of New York. Now, this was kind of a controversial choice because Governor Clinton was himself a controversial figure. He was a controversial figure within New York politics. He was a longtime governor, had served five full terms. And just that preceding April of 1792, he had been reelected under suspicious circumstances. Briefly, what happened was uh, New York had very particular rules about how ballots should be sealed and delivered. And the sheriff had to seal them in a particular way in boxes, and the sheriff had to deliver them. And the three Western counties, which were heavily Federalist, and therefore expected to vote heavily in favor of John Jay, the sheriffs in those counties did not follow those rules. And so the, there was this debate about should those votes be counted? And, and of course, it was predictable. As, you know, if you were a Republican who supported Clinton, you said, we have to follow the rules to a T. You know, they did not follow the rules. Therefore, it's not, it would not be proper to count them. And of course, the Federalists who supported John Jay said, oh, come on, you're being too much of a stickler for the rules. You know, these people voted in good faith. It's, it's, I'm saying it's predictable because obviously those are the two positions anybody would take in similar circumstances. That's the positions they would have reversed. They would have been in reverse, you know, if, if the situation had been reversed. It's not like Republicans were innately sticklers for the rules. And if anything, according to their reputation, it was the Federalists who were sticklers for rules. But anyway... Uh, so that was the argument that went back and forth. It went on for a long time, all through the summer of 92. Um, ended up with Governor Clinton continuing on as governor, winning the re-election. But it did hurt his image in the country. Because it, this had been reported in the press, and there the, developed this image that, oh, Clinton had won re-election through shady circumstances. You know, he had stolen the election. Uh, so... Clinton wasn't like a super strong candidate, although he was, I mean, there weren't any perfect candidates in 1792 to run against John Adams. But anyway, Clinton was kind of, became kind of the consensus candidate among Republicans, uh, but he had some baggage, let's just put it that way. And the fact that he had been one of the leaders of the anti-federalist movement in 1788, that still was a bit of an issue for some people. Like there were some people who didn't trust him because of that. They didn't believe that he really did support the constitution. Anyway, during the summer and into the fall of 1792, Republican talk was kind of gelling around 
Clinton. And I, and I put it that way because, again, this was not a party in the modern sense of the word. They did not have a formal system for nominating candidates. The Federalists and the Republicans, as of 1792, were just a collection of like-minded people. And so the Republicans were, all, you know, the Republican leadership, you know, the, the, the prominent members of the Republican movement were communicating uh, with each other through letters and occasionally like meeting in person and talking about these, the, these issues and talking about the different candidates, uh, different possible people they could put up as vice president. But it wasn't a formal process. Now, a lot of the consideration on the part of Republicans was who could defeat Adams. Um, and that was really what was important to them. It wasn't so much who is the best man for the job as vice president, but who can defeat Adams. It was really a referendum on Vice President Adams. Federalists supported Adams. Republicans were opposed to Adams being vice president. Um, that was really what, the, what this voting was about. Um, and so they gravitated toward Clinton, presumably because they thought Clinton had a, a high likelihood of getting a lot of electoral votes from different, part, different states of the union. However, in early September, a counter movement arose among some Republicans to nominate Burr instead of Clinton. Aaron Burr was a U.S. Senator from New York, another prominent figure in New York politics at the time. One major consideration was that Clinton had just barely eked out a win and gotten a re-election in New York as governor. If he were to suddenly leave New York and become vice president, that the governor's office would be vacant and it was no, there was no guarantee that a Republican would be elected. The speculation of Burr versus Clinton went on during September and into October. But then on October 16th, uh, a number of prominent Republicans from various states came and met together in Philadelphia. And after a lengthy discussion, they agreed to uh, support Clinton as their candidate for vice president. Now, this event is kind of symbolic because it represents the first, like, political action. It's kind of the first caucus in American history. A caucus is when party activists or party members get together and figure out who they want to support as their candidate for a given office. This was not something that was done in the early 1790s very often because, again, Political parties in the early 1790s were not political parties in the modern sense. They were really just amorphous factions, amorphous like schools of thought um, in American politics. And so if you were a Republican or a Federalist, it's not because you formally joined that party. It's just these were agglomerations of like-minded people. Um, but we're seeing in 1792 the first little glimmerings of what would eventually evolve into uh, the first party system of the late 1790s into the early 1800s. So by late October, November, the choices in the election had clarified. You had George Washington as the clear preference of everyone to be president. And then there was a choice of vice president between John Adams and George Clinton. Now the process of electing the president, I talked about this when I did the uh, video on the election of 1789. First, you have to choose electors, and then the electors choose the president. So they had to choose electors first. And choosing electors in those days did not mean choosing someone who's pledged to a certain candidate. That's how it works in the U.S. today. Um, electors who are chosen from the different states are chosen specifically because they are pledged to vote for a certain candidate when the Electoral College meets. That was not the case in the 1790s. You were choosing just presumably wise men of good judgment who would make their best choices to who should be the president. Uh, but practically speaking, since there were very clear philosophical divisions between Federalists and Republicans, you were really choosing either a Federalist elector or a uh, Republican elector or set of electors. But Congress had tweaked the uh, process a little bit since the last time. In the 1789 election, Congress had given states a single day in which to choose their electors. And uh, it so happened that year that New York had not been able to choose its electors on that given day, J January 7th of 1789. And so New York was deprived of electors that year. Perhaps as uh, a way of remedying against that or pre preventing that from happening again, Congress made a new election law 
that said that states had to choose their electors within a 34-day period uh, preceding the Electoral College vote. The way it would work would be uh, the Electoral College would meet and choose the president on the first Wednesday in December. And then the 34 days preceding that was the period in time which the, each state had to choose its electors. And it could do it however it wanted to. If it wanted to have like a popular vote for electors, it could do that. It could have the state legislature could choose it, you know, whatever they want to do. Um, so in 1792, the Electoral College was going to meet on December 5th. And the 34 days before that was November 1st. So the states had between November 1st and, and December 4th to choose their electors. Uh, New York, for example, uh, the New York legislature chose its electors on November 20th. There were 15 states in the Union. There were the original 13 states, all of which by this time had ratified the Constitution. And then Vermont and Kentucky had also joined. That made 15. In nine of the states, the state legislature chose the electors. In five of the states, the electors were elected directly by the people, either on a district-by-district district basis or a statewide. And then in one state, Massachusetts, they had a hybrid system where essentially the voters would nominate candidates and then the state legislature chose from among those nominations. The way the Electoral College worked was electors each had two votes. And so in this particular election, all the electors from all 15 states voted for George Washington as one of their votes. And then for their second vote, 77 of the electors voted for John Adams, 50 of the electors voted for George Clinton. George Clinton's support came from the state of New York and also Virginia, North Carolina, and Georgia. All the electors in those states cast votes for Clinton. Also, one of Pennsylvania's electors voted for Clinton. The other Pennsylvania electors all voted for Adams. In South Carolina, South Carolina had eight electoral votes. Seven of them voted for John Adams, which was not surprising because South Carolina was a stronghold of federalism in the South and also had a lot of war debt. So it was kind of in favor of Hamilton's policies. One of the electors voted for Aaron Burr. Uh, Kentucky had four electors and all four of them voted for George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. But anyway, that's the election of 1792. George Washington got the most electoral votes, and he was elected president. John Adams got the second most electoral votes, and he was elected vice president. George Washington, you know, he, he has this reputation as setting tons of precedents for future presidents, which is totally true, and he was very self-conscious about it when he was president. And one of the precedents that George Washington is supposed to have set was the idea of serving two terms and then leaving office peacefully and voluntarily. And yeah, technically that's true. Um, but we could make a mistake when we talk about it that way of thinking that somehow he had like premeditated that, that he was like, oh, I think two terms is a good length for a president and then I'll leave. No, he didn't want to serve for eight years. That was way too long as far as he was concerned. He wanted to serve way shorter than that. But imagine if he had set another precedent, which he was perfectly capable of setting. This could very easily have happened. What if he had set the precedent of the president always resigns? Like, he could have done that. And it would have been totally different. Like, imagine American presidential history where presidents are just sort of expected that they'll resign. That they have some policy goal that they have to achieve. Once they achieve that policy goal, they leave office. Now... How often would that have actually happened? I don't know. You know, Washington was kind of a unique individual, and then he was probably the only man ever to be president who hated being president and wanted to stop being president as soon as possible. Um, but that's one thing that could have been very different if things had gone differently. But and 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 that shows that, you know, I you know, I think maybe part of the reason 1792 doesn't get a lot of attention is that on the surface there doesn't seem to be a lot of drama. But under the surface, there was a lot of drama. And that drama was happening within George Washington's own head because there was the drama of George Washington debating whether he really wanted to go through with a second term. He did not have many more years on the earth left. And the fact that he sacrificed four more of those years to be in Philadelphia when he really wanted to be in Mount Vernon, um, like at Mount Vernon doing his thing. Like Anyway, that's one thing about the 1792 election. But the other is... 
it represents, I think, a kind of bittersweet moment where you have, it's like this hinge moment in election history. Um, Because what happened was, you know, when when the the framers created the Constitution in 1787, they imagined that they were creating this republic where where the leading figures in all the states would all kind of get along and work together to make the republic work. That's what the whole electoral college was supposed to be. You elect a, uh, a bunch of very smart men with good sense of judgment, and they will use their knowledge of the prominent men of the of the of the United States to figure out who they should choose as their president. And that's not how the Electoral College works. That's how they thought it was going to work, naively. Let's be totally honest. They were super naive about it. But when the 1789 election happened, it was supposed to work that way. And it kind of worked that way. Although there was some, you know, backroom shenanigans happening. And then in 1792, it was also sort of supposed to work that way. What happened with 1792 was people knew there were these two factions, but they thought the factions were temporary. And so even as late as 1792, people could go along with this idea of, oh, we're going to use political shenanigans to try to get Adams out of office or whatever. We're going to like, you know, we're not conspire, but we're going to like coordinate our electing so we can make sure we get Adams out. But they all thought thought of that as a temporary expediency. And eventually they were going to go back to the way it was supposed to be, which was an apolitical system where people just use their individual judgment to pick who they think is the best man for the job. Um, everybody thought it was going to work that way. Even Hamilton, who had done all that shenanigans back in 1789, all that backroom dealing or, you know, coordination, they all thought that they were doing a short-term expediency to kind of, you know, cover to cover things right now for this one crisis, and then we can go back to the way things ought to be, the apolitical consensus system that we all imagined it would be. And 1792 is the last election where you can really hope for that, because the 1796 election, the next one coming up, was very partisan, very clearly partisan. And I don't know if you can still have illusions after that point that the U.S. like electoral system is going to work the way the framers had imagined it would work. So 1792 is kind of that little like twilight period of the naive imaginings, the, the, the idealizations of the framers before the harsh reality of human nature set in. Uh, anyway, thanks for joining me.